Welcome to another Foss North. I would like to start by thanking our gold sponsors, our silver sponsors, our base sponsors, and our partners from the community. So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker, Leslie. So Leslie, take it away. Excellent. Thanks so much for that introduction, Johan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leslie Hawthorne, and I am here today to talk to you about the business of community, strategic open source engagement for vertical markets. A uh, brief uh, about me, I am a manager of the vertical community strategy team within Red Hat's open source program office. We reside in the office of the CTO, and my team's mission is to steward Red Hat's relationship with the various organizations that relate to our verticals-based business from a community perspective. So uh, before we get started with the meat of this presentation, I just wanted to share some parameters so we all kind of know before we go what the material for today is going to look like. Uh, first of all, you're going to hear an awful lot about Red Hat in this presentation. Uh, I promise you that this is not a series of shameless plugs, um, although I will tell you later that I'm hiring. That will be my one shameless plug later in this presentation. Um, so normally I give talks that focus on community engagement and a lot of culture topics. So I don't necessarily talk a great deal about the ins and outs of my day-to-day -day work. But since this is about uh, verticals community practice and that's what I'm doing at Red Hat, you're gonna hear a lot of uh, personal examples from Red Hat and hopefully uh, some examples from other folks that I've worked with in the community as well. Uh, we will also be exploring a great deal, but not all. Uh, turns out the verticals universe is vast. And when uh, Johan originally asked me to give this presentation, I thought, oh, I will cover all of the topics. And then I wrote this slide deck and thought, I will not be covering all of the topics. So we'll get to as much as we possibly can today. And I'm really happy to have follow-up conversations with folks later in social media or via email. Uh, and last but not least, I'm really, I'm looking to learn uh, as part of giving this presentation. This is just one point of view. It's my point of view based on my own experience. If folks wanna reach out and get in touch and have further discussions, I'm super open to it and excited to learn from others in the community. Maybe we start a LinkedIn group, I don't know, we'll figure it out later. So before we talk about verticals community engagement, I wanted to talk a little bit about compare and contrast between what we think of sort of as con traditional community management within open source projects versus how you do this with verticals. So a traditional uh, community management paradigm is that you have one person focused on community engagement or many, and they're focused on that from the perspective of the project. So for example, um, how does the Ceph project work with other projects in you know, you know, achieving the mission of creating storage? Versus when you're dealing with verticals-based community engagement, you're actually looking at a whole bunch of different community interaction points, some of which overlap, some of which do not. So you may be uh, equally excited about working with an industry consortia uh, in order to produce a reference architecture or create a specification. And that work may never actually touch some of the software development that you're doing in a particular open source project for the same vertical. Um, but despite the fact that there are differences in the approach, the underlying formula for success is exactly the same. You have to know your audience, you have to meet them where they are, and you need to make sure that whatever it is that you're providing within that community context provides actual value to the participants in that community and make sure that that genuine value is as much value to the other participants as it is for your own business. So next we'll get into the three major pillars of verticals community engagement. We're gonna be talking about software projects, software foundations, and industry consortia. So if we take a view from uh, the, the FSI world, specifically the financial services area, um, there are opportunities to work with your customers and your partners within the open source project context and actually to do um, collaboration and co-creation directly in the upstream. And this is typically a wonderful vehicle for engagement for vertical markets that have a long standing history with open source software. So the financial services folks have been using open source for a very, very long time. And now they're taking steps toward actually open sourcing software that they've created behind their own firewalls, publishing that as open source and building communities of collaboration around it. 
So if we look at uh, examples like Audubon, produced by Deutsche Bank, or Symphony, which was originally a project from Goldman Sachs, and there's, a, there's an entire landscape here of projects where various engineers can collaborate and co-create with their with customers in the upstream. And part of the, the value of that is not just being able to bring a product to market, but it is deepening the value of the technology that you provide to your customer and also deepening your business relationship through that process of collaboration and co-creation. Our next pillar is software foundations and software foundation. I've listed three here as examples, although there is a there is a wide universe also of software foundations. And the, the value of software foundations is to create a very well understood and neutral space for collaboration. Uh, as more and more vertical market players are entering into understanding that they need to have a viable open source strategy as part of their business operations, they're getting used to this idea of coopetition or collaborating and co-creating with their competitors often for the first time. And by working within the context of one of these software foundations where there are very clear rules for engagement, um, these foundations have bylaws, they typically have um, operating rules for the various technical steering committees, they have guidelines for um, how particular decisions are made within the project. There's of course a style guideline so that everyone understands what the coding conventions are for that project. By having this space created that is, again, it's a neutral home. It is a place with well understood rules and it is a place where people can come together and collaborate on technology that is not necessarily uh, related to their core line of business, but where they understand that by working with others in a community context, they're able to increase value for their business, even if that value accrues to a competitor, the overall return on investment is very high because of that ability to leverage the wisdom of the crowds in this neutral community context. Uh, and our final pillar, industry consortia. So um, what you see here is a swath of logos for various uh, industry consortia that work in the telecom space. I am not even going to pretend that I understand what each of the or these organizations do. Fortunately, I have uh, an expert on my team who deeply understands the telco domain. We'll talk about the importance of having uh, domain experts later on in this presentation. But the, the goal here of understanding the role of industry consortia is that these are groups where uh, folks are traditionally able to come together and collaborate uh, in highly regulated industries uh, where they're working on technology that spans the globe and there's a need to interoperate between various countries, various jurisdictions, understanding what the laws are for each region. And the output of these industry consortia is often the creation of standards, reference architectures, uh, and even recommendations to public policy bodies about how to enact regulation or create laws that govern how these uh, particular vertical markets are going to work. So now we're gonna dive into uh, the different types of approaches to uh, verticals community engagement. And I'll give you a, an overview of some of the different ways in which you can conceptualize how you're engaging with vertical markets from a community perspective. So the first way that I uh, will bring forward is this concept of the technology-led engagement. Um, if you are interested in engaging in a particular verticals-based community because you are looking to advance the technology state of the art, right? your ultimate goal is to uh, either change the way something works by creating new features in a particular software project or to uh, bring your own expertise to market so that it it changes the way the entire industry thinks about a particular technical problem space. You're looking at a, at a technology-led engagement strategy. And the, we'll get more into the meat of the, the resourcing aspect of this, but there are a number of uh, companies who are excited about engaging with community from a technology-leading perspective. And one of the most important things that you can do when you are looking to engage with communities to advance the technical state of the art is make sure that your resourcing strategy is well thought out and in place um, from day one, because uh, it is a 
it is a difficult situation when you want to advance the technical state of the art, but you just do not have enough developer resources to bring to bear to make that happen. <clears throat> Another way to think about your community investment strategy is from the perspective of uh, sales leadership. So there will be any number of times when your field teams may come to you and let you know about a particular uh, software project, software foundation, industry consortia, or other membership organization. And they will uh, let you know that it is very important that your company joins in uh, with this membership organization in order for uh, the field team to close a sale, to be able to do more traditional business development activities by being able to engage with some of the influencers within that membership community. And in order to um, you know, advance uh, and influence within that particular membership body uh, and get the, you know, get the message across that your company has something of value to offer to those members. Um, <clears throat> at Red Hat, we don't necessarily typically uh, invest in membership organizations just for the sake of getting a logo on a website, but for very large organizations, there are any number of, of times when folks uh, join a membership organization for the sake of showing their uh, customers and their constituents that they're invested in a particular technology space. But other than uh, the marketing and business development aspect, there isn't necessarily deeper engagement or any software development activities. A third way to think about your investment strategy is this concept of being collaboration led. When you are looking to engage in community in order to directly build joint solutions, either with your customers or partners, and you're typically doing this in a context of <clears throat> writing software for upstream open source projects. Uh, this, the goal may be to uh, enhance the state of the art in an upstream project in a way that adds value directly for your customer and to be able to do so by collaborating and co-creating with your customer in that upstream context so that your subject matter experts and their subject matter experts are able to work on a shared infrastructure in a shared problem space and be able to iterate on technology features together in a very tight feedback loop. Our fourth way to think about uh, how to do your investment strategy is what I call network led, uh, which is just a fancy way of saying um, your, your own employees are excited about a particular software project or a technology space because their friends are interested in it and they're seeing the the potential rise in popularity of a particular technology domain area. And in these cases where you have a particularly passionate employee who wants to engage in that project space or at the very least closely monitor developments there, um, your business case, your, your goal is to uncover your business case there for future investment by allocating a small amount of resources to, to investigate along the lines of that particular employee or group of employees' personal passions. So at sometimes you're going to uh, architect your strategy around the, the, the engagement of your employees with their own networks and see what business opportunities are going to be uncovered in the future. And then the last way to think about how you're going to architect your uh, investment strategy in community is this concept of being thought leadership led. And in these cases, you're not necessarily engaging with a particular community in order to build a product. You're not engaging with a particular community in order to do traditional business development activities. You're really engaging in that community in order to help your customers solve their strategic business problems. So uh, I think a great example that I'd like to, to share with folks is if you look at the FinTech Open Source Foundation, uh, these folks are focused on FinTech and financial services. In addition to being a foundation that hosts various open source software project development, they also have a couple of different working groups that focus more on the organizational challenges and opportunities of uh, engaging with open source software. So one of those is their open source readiness working group where individuals from various FSI firms come together to um, perform knowledge sharing, to ask uh, questions of their peers in a uh, secure environment, everything from questions about open source licensing strategy to uh, understanding what sort of developer training resources might be required 
for developers and FSI firms to be able to effectively uh, use open source software as part of their day jobs. The FinTech Open Source Foundation also offers a, an inner source significant interest group. Uh, this is a relatively new group, group within the FinTech Open Source Foundation, but it's the membership has taken off like wildfire. And the idea behind this significant interest group is to help financial services firms be able to adopt inner source methodologies and to understand how uh, the principles of open source development as instituted behind the firewall through inner source uh, can help the organization achieve uh, you know, organizational culture paradigm shifts so that folks understand how to collaborate across teams, across silos, and to, to build trust and mutual rapport within the organization. Uh, and if you're an old school open source person like me, you're hoping that as they start their inner source journey that they eventually graduate and begin fully participating in open source communities. So the truth is that uh, your most successful community engagement strategy actually combines all five of these elements. And uh, it may be that your participation in a particular software project, foundation, or industry consortium may encompass all five of these elements or only one, but you need to be able to make sure that you have elements of each aspect as part of your engagement strategy in order to be successful. And the other key aspect of this is making sure that as you're doing this cross-functional engagement with your multi-pronged strategy with all of your external stakeholders in various community spaces, you're also doing that behind your own firewall within your company with your internal stakeholders. Um, there is not, there is never going to be a successful community strategy related to verticals that does not involve your engineering teams and your sales teams and your marketing teams and your business development professionals and all the fine folks who are doing your data and analytics to make sure that there's return on investment for the, the fine work you're doing. So again, holistic approach to community engagement and that holistic approach should be applied uh, within your the community context and equally so behind your corporate firewall. So <clears throat> let's talk about, about uh, different ways in which you can architect your community engagement strategy from the perspective of uh, different ways that that engagement strategy can uh, be seen in the various activities that you'll do kind of like hands-on boots on the ground. So when you are thinking about how you are going to architect that strategy, you need to have a very clear understanding of what you think final success looks like. Um, engaging with a particular community because you think that it will open up the doors for your sales teams to have uh, new conversations with new sets of customers is a good and noble goal. That is not an effective uh, view of what success looks like, nor is that something around which you can put measurable success criteria and understand if your community engagement strategy is actually producing return on investment for your company. So success can look like many things depending on your strategic goals. It could be that you've brought a new product to market. It could be that your customers have deepened their relationship with your organization to the point that they are calling you for advice about how to uh, select the next products for their software stack to make sure that whatever they choose is good for them for the next 10 years. Uh, it could be that you're a trusted partner in helping your customers achieve digital transformation because you're able to bring knowledge and wisdom to them about uh, open organizational principles. Or it could be that success looks like having enough information about a particular technology area so that when the market evolves and it's very clear that, for example, we're moving from Docker to Kubernetes, you are ready to engage fully and change your strategy in a very agile fashion to meet the needs of the market while still serving the needs of the customers that you have engaged with who have not yet begun to think about that evolutionary transition so that you can bring them along with you as that change is made. Again, talking about really, you know, boots on the ground topics and how to, you know, how to roll up your sleeves and get things done. Um, Sometimes you're going to need to look at forging your own new community. Um, those folks who have uh, deep experience in the open source software world 
uh, are probably groaning when they hear me say this because we are all thinking not yet another software foundation, um, but enough of that inside baseball. Uh, you know, the, the goal here is not to create a, a new uh, membership organization for every single piece of technology that is brought to the fore or for every single new industry space. But it is important to consider that for industry verticals that are just now starting to uh, understand their own journey with open source. So I'm thinking about folks like manufacturing, retail, um, energy to some extent. You're, it's, it's not uh, the usual strategy of saying, oh, wonderful, we'll show up in this particular software foundation in this particular open source software project and we'll join this particular industry consortia um, those resources may simply not exist at this point in time. So instead of a more traditional um, meeting them where they are within our previously mentioned three pillars, uh, you may take your first steps with in the form of uh, customer education. And what I mean by customer education is this can be anything from something that looks like a traditional lunch and learn session where uh, you join your customers at this point virtually, but once upon a time it was in person, literally over lunch. Uh, to talk about a, a topic that is more uh, focused on educating the customer about a particular technology area. So at Red Hat, uh, we have something called the Open Source Enablement Community of Practice, uh, of which I am a member. And the goal of that community of practice within Red Hat is to create materials that can educate customers, prospects, or um, honestly, anyone who is interested in learning more about open source software and open source development methodologies uh, so that they are uh, prepared with some tools to begin considering their own perspective on how they consume open source, uh, how they contribute changes that they make in those projects back upstream, and to understand how the principles of open organizations uh, which were really de derived from the principles of open source software development methodologies, how those principles can help to inform a company's own uh, approach to organizational change, uh, because it's great if we're choosing the best possible tools, but if we're not empowering our employees to be able to work in a new way, uh, it doesn't matter how great our tools are, they're not going to be able to, to succeed in their quest to transform the business. So the key takeaway here is if you are operating in an industry vertical space where it is fledgling in its understanding of participation in open source, go the traditional customer education route, really focus on making sure that your uh, constituents have the, the resources and tools that they need to, to more deeply investigate on their own so that they can begin more fully participating. Meet them where they are and take them along on their journey with you. <clears throat> it's also most frequently that as we're looking at how we're putting together our community engagement strategy that we're looking at, you know, what is our path to product? And this is, this is particularly important for organizations that don't necessarily have a huge level of resources to bring to bear. Um, at Red Hat, we have 16,000 employees worldwide. We are, uh, I like to think of us as lean and mean and uh, applying our resources where they will, have, they will have the most value. Uh, when I look at some of my friends who are working in the small and medium enterprise space, they are absolutely in the same boat. You do not have infinite resources to bring to bear. So when you're looking at places to invest from a community perspective, look where you actually have a possible path to product and you have engineering resources that you can dedicate to the problem space in a sustained fashion and where you can bring the most value by contributing technical work product. While you're putting together your uh, community engagement strategy, uh, remember, even though market verticals encompass the entire world, right? So if you look at retail, things are sold all over the world. Um, if you look at energy, people are consuming energy all over the world. Um, you cannot architect a one size fits all strategy and hope that it will be successful. Uh, and this is this encompasses a few different uh, aspects. One, um, it, it's probably obvious, but I will say it anyway. 
um, local customs and the way that different people do business based on their culture, based on their native language, based on the customs that they um, have known since childhood matter. So, um, you know, do not do not find yourself turning up to uh, an event in Europe with a key theme of that uh, event being a focus on digital sovereignty and talk about the uh, amazing traction that U.S. hyperscalers have gained in um, creating AI infrastructures. True story. Wasn't me. Don't be that person. Um, you also have to consider local market dynamics in terms of the actual regulatory bodies and uh, the different uh, laws of that region. So right now I'm thinking of, for example, if we look at uh, New Zealand. So New Zealand is not what we would call a world major market, but they are also the first country on this planet to pass regulatory legislation requiring that financial services firms consider climate risk as part of the risk assessment in their investment portfolios. Uh, and if we look at how well uh, New Zealand handled their response to COVID, I would say that they are an excellent uh, set of folks working in the public policy space to help us understand how we react to external pressures and, in fact, to crises um, in, a, in a legislative and regulatory way. So I think that it's, it's pretty clear that the rest of the world is going to go in New Zealand's direction pretty soon. And it's also worth noting that there's an open source project called OS Climate that's spinning up precisely to address these particular dynamics. Um, not to pick on the FSI space or necessarily on, on New Zealand, although I'm a big fan of that particular place. Um, you know, if we also look at things like, for example, the automotive vertical, uh, you may be looking to, as Red Hat is doing, uh, create an operating system that uh, runs in vehicle and that's wonderful. Red Hat is a platform company. We are hoping to provide the best possible solution to the global market. But turns out, if you're looking to do that kind of work, you had better know TUV in, uh, in Germany, the local certifying body who makes sure that uh, consumer products are safe. And this is everything from my daughter's toys to how automobiles operate. Um, so again, global perspectives on verticals, but if you do not keep in mind the needs of local market dynamics, both from a culture perspective, a regulatory perspective, and also um, a, a, a human values and personal beliefs perspective, your strategy is not going to be effective. Um, it is very important to realize that you cannot do it all. Uh, and this is, this is equally true of very large firms and very small firms. For very small firms or small medium enterprises, it's, it's very obvious that you have limited resources to allocate and you cannot do it all. Um, for very large firms, the, the concern is even if you have many more resources to bring to bear in a particular vertical market space, um, that your approach is fragmented because you have uh, too many folks working in too many disparate areas and you're not able to effectively bring it all together holistically with your internal and your external stakeholders. So while you're trying to decide what to do, since you cannot do it all, my advice to folks is to focus on creating the maximum value in, in, the, in your particular community engagements. And I don't just mean um, what is going to create the greatest return on investment for your particular company. It's also how you can provide the most value within those community spaces and have the most positive impact for all participants, because through that creation of maximum value, for everyone involved, you're not only helping your, your customers and potential customers uh, greater, more effectively achieve their business goals, you are also ensuring that you have deepened your relationship with these folks and then they will be uh, more excited to hear from your sales force when they call upon them later. Uh, last but not least, it's, uh, it's important when you're architecting your uh, well, any community engagement strategy, but particularly for vertical markets, uh, because your work in these vertical markets communities directly, very publicly touches upon uh, spaces in which your customers and partners and prospects operate, uh, that when you are thinking about how you're going to engage with a particular community, you need to make sure that you have a, a plan for evaluating ongoing investment and what your exit strategy is when you are ready to leave a particular community. And there's, there's lots of reasons 
uh, for leaving a community. It's not just that you found that your investment in that community didn't provide you with the results you wanted. Uh, it may be that you engaged in an open source software project in order to advance the technology state of the art and that software project has achieved its goals and is now in ongoing maintenance mode. And there are sufficient maintainers available to ensure that that code base stays healthy and strong for everyone who needs it. Uh, in that case, you may look to reallocate resources. It may be that one of your employees who is a subject matter expert in a particular area uh, moves to Tahiti and is no longer available to bring to bear their technical prowess in this project space. Um, it may be that budgets have shifted. There are all sorts of reasons why you may look to a particular uh, community. It's perfectly fine to, to make an exit gracefully, but it is always important to make that exit gracefully. And you can do so by giving uh, adequate notice to the organization from which you are departing. Uh, some organizations actually have it written into their bylaws what the notice period is for your departure. So make sure you always honor those bylaws when giving notice that you will no longer be a member in a particular membership-based organization. And uh, whenever possible, if you can, try to line up uh, resources to replace you when you're ready to leave. This may look like um, if, if you have the skill set within your organization and there's interest to do so, potentially uh, helping to line up other funders, other software maintainers, um, other marketing and documentation folks even. You know, when you are ready to go, Leave the project better than you found it and make sure that your departure is one that does not leave people uh, struggling because they had relied upon your efforts and those, eff those efforts are suddenly absent. So <clears throat> we're about to get to the, to, to the end of our remarks today. Um, I think I wanna leave you with a really, well, from my perspective, a really important set of guidelines and that's that's the song remains the same right i've talked an awful lot about uh engagement in communities from a verticals perspective today and a lot of specifics about how those particular vertical engagement strategies touch on different aspects of the business but uh, no matter what success in community engagement isn't necessarily different because it's about verticals or it's about uh, a particular market it's really about how you meet the needs of your audience, how you provide them value, and how you help them be successful in their own quest. So one caveat, <clears throat> uh, I said that your approach, be it for verticals or, uh, or traditional open source software project uh, open source community management uh, is the same. And I'm about to, to, to go back and reverse my previous perspective there in just one way. Um, and that's, if you're doing verticals community engagement, you really need to hire someone who is a domain expert in that particular vertical. Um, once upon a time, if someone had asked me, what is the key to hiring uh, an effective resource for community engagement? I would have told you that the most important thing is if you're working in an open source software context, that that person that you hire has a great background working with open source communities and open source projects that they understand open source software licensing, that they understand the dynamics of you know, developer engagement from a community perspective. And you know, in an ideal universe, perhaps they have been a software developer um, who is community minded within the particular project that you're looking to, to engage with. That's, that's great. That's actually really, in my humble opinion, really good advice for sort of our traditional community engagement paradigm where you have one project at the center with uh, different, different spokes of engagement across that wheel. For verticals, I have to tell you, if you do not hire someone who understands that vertical and speaks the language of that vertical, it does not matter how expert your person is in, in understanding open source communities and understanding community engagement and understanding things like principles of design thinking, um, they will not be able to meet their audience where they are. It's just not possible. Um, so when we've looked at building out our vertical community architecture team, we have, uh, we have focused on finding the right individuals with a background in the particular vertical. And in some cases we have, well, in two cases, we have been fortunate to find unicorns who not only have uh, expertise within a particular vertical domain, but also experience working in open source communities. Uh, so I am very privileged to be able to lead a team, including Ms. Lisa Kaywood, 
who has 20 years of telco experience and uh, has spent much of that time working in uh, open source project contexts, including time at the Linux Foundation. Uh, and also as we have hired for support of Red Hat's automotive community initiatives, uh, I've been lucky enough to bring on board Jeff Ozier Mixon, uh, who has a background in embedded systems, has worked on uh, different initiatives within the automotive space, and has also been a long time participant in open source software projects, including uh, a long time as the community manager for the Octo project. Uh, and as I mentioned at the very start of this presentation, my single shameless plug, um, I am hiring right now for a community engagement professional focused on the FSI space. So if you are a unicorn who understands and can speak FinTech and financial services and also knows open source software communities, I would love to hear from you. Uh, if you are a person who understands FinTech and financial services and would be excited to learn more about the process of community engagement, I would love to hear from you as well. You'll find my contact details at the end of this presentation. And finally, folks, the, the absolutely not secret formula for successful community strategy. Um, for verticals, hire the right person with domain expertise. For every other type of community engagement, again, the rules are the same. Understand your audience. You need to know what the people you are engaging with need, what they, what they need for their customers, what they need from you, and how you are going to help them get where they need to go so that they understand the value you provide to them in a community context and a business context. You need to meet your audience where they are. So if they are very early on their open source strategic journey, you need to probably do a lot more work in the customer education space. If they are advanced in their uh, journey with consuming and contributing to open source software, you're going to be meeting them in you know, grassroots developer meetups and you're gonna be co-collaborating -collaborate, and co-creating with them in upstream open source projects. And uh, perhaps most importantly, always you need to provide genuine value. Um, it is not enough to show up with a, an opinionated technical stance that you think is important because it helps you sell your products. It is important to show up in upstream project contexts with technology that adds value to advance the state of the art. It is insufficient to show up in a community context simply to market your company and to market the products that you sell. It is important to also show up in that context to help the organization's members be successful in their goals and also to help the strength and the reach of that organization in which you are participating so that you are serving all of the constituents within that project, not just yourself. And uh, for those who, who wonder why you would be focused on providing more value than you capture, it has been my, I'm old, nearly 20 years of experience um, working in the open source uh, project space and in the business context that if you do this work in community where you are focused on providing genuine value and creating more value than you capture, um, your customers will, will like you and they will want to do business with you and they may want to may like you and may want to do business with you because of that deepened relationship, even more than they appreciate uh, the cool software you produce or the products that they can buy from you. And my dear friends, that is the conclusion of my presentation. I will now admit that I cannot see my timer. So hopefully I have not finished very, very early, but I will find out now. Hi, how do we do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. There is some uh, questions here, so uh, are you ready? I will happily take questions. Please tell me what they are. Wait a minute while I stop. I would like to stop sharing and I would like to be me. I'm me. Hi. <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm going to read it up here with your background as community manager uh, and now perhaps being more into business. How would you say communities have changed over the years? Oh, wow. That's a really great question. Okay. I'm going to do story time. So once upon a time, a very long time ago, I started my, my working career with open source software focused on a community that some folks may have heard of called Google Summer of Code. And the idea there was to get 
students involved working in free and open source software projects during their summer holidays. And it, again, I'm only talking about my own experience. Maybe I'm just super naive, but I think once upon a time, there was a lot of focus on the idea of engaging with open source projects and open source community because you were particularly passionate about either the technology, the humans you were collaborating with, or both. Um, and I think over time, as open source software has become ubiquitous and more and more businesses are recognizing the value of consuming open source software and potentially contributing to open source software projects, there's become more of a, uh, I don't know what the right word is, corporate focus on open source software. So once upon a time when I talked to, to free software hackers, they were like, I believe in freedom. I believe in the importance of having an auditable code base. I believe in the importance of my software being available for anyone to use freely for whatever purpose they require it to be used for. And I, I believe in the equality of everyone having access to my source code so that a big company can use it, but also a, you know, a nonprofit that's trying to serve um, underrepresented groups who need help can also use my software. Um, now, when you talk to folks about like, why are you excited about working in open source software projects? I hear more often like, it's gonna help me get a job. Um, you know, if I work in open source, I get to work with really cool stuff like Kubernetes and lots of people are hiring for Kubernetes talent or, you know, I want to work on open source because that's how, that's the future of software development. So of course I want to be engaged with, you know, the, the, how things are going to be done the best way possible in the future. Um, I don't know how to feel about that development, to be honest, because I am a romantic idealist who is constantly disappointed with the state of the world. So on the one hand, I think like, where is the love? Why are we not all in it for the love? And then I think I'm in my forties now, maybe my idealism was more because I was a younger child when I started out with this process. Um, I will say though, that I'm really fortunate to be able to work with people who are working in so many different areas of open source software development. It's not just providing people with Linux solutions or containerized stuff, right? Like just last week I was talking to uh, the Digital Impact Alliance, which is part of the United Nations Foundation and they're creating software solutions in order to help uh, people in uh, emerging economies to be able to create economic development models for themselves and their fellow citizens using open source software. So there's there's still a ton of idealism out there in the in the free software world, and I I have my best moments when I engage there, but I would say communities over time have become become more business focused, less passion focused, and that may just be the natural evolution of, of any community as their output becomes more popular. Um, but if you would like to hang out with me in the romantic idealism quadrant, that's that's cool too. We have good coffee. Please join us. Thanks. Um, I wish I was in my forties, by the way. Um, the, and how, how would you say the <laughs> companies? I'm sorry, you have so many words. <laughs> how would you say the companies have changed over the years? Oh boy. Well, that there are so many different ways to answer that. Um, one, companies have gotten a clue that investing in their open source strategy is a good idea and benefits their business in ways that probably I didn't think were possible when I first started working in the open source space. If someone had told me 10 years ago that, you know, Microsoft would embrace Linux or if someone had told me, you know, 10 years ago that Amazon would have an, an open source program office that would, had hired some of my best friends, I would have laughed. Uh, and, you know, invited you to the romantic ideals in the corner to have coffee with me. Um, so, so the companies have changed by really figuring out that, that open source software is an important part of their strategy. And this is, this is, you know, companies in every single market vertical. It just depends kind of on where they are and figuring out that that is true. Uh, I will say, uh, and this is probably my own bias naivete. Um, I would say that companies have, this, this comes from working at Red Hat for six years. If this is not your experience, I'm sorry, folks, your mileage may vary. Um, I would say the companies have gotten much more sophisticated in understanding that sort of a non-hierarchical bottoms-up approach to technology development and organizational structure provides better results. Um, because if you don't empower your employees 
to be successful and you do not create a genuine environment of psychological safety for them to do their work in, you're not going to get the best possible results. And companies that do allow their employees that psychological safety to both fail and experiment and experiment with all of their colleagues, right? Not just the colleagues in their little cubicle farm area or in their one department or in their like big team, you know, like the, all of their colleagues. Um, turns out your best possible talent wants that opportunity. And if you do not provide it to them, they will take their talent and they will go elsewhere. And so I am, I am thrilled to see more and more companies, you know, opening up to the idea of sort of open organizational principles and, and moving away from traditional hierarchies to, to environments that support um, wider collaboration and provide, you know, again, genuine psychological safety to their employees so that when you tell people iterate, experiment, uh, you know, make big changes, some experiments fail, that it's actually true, right? Because you get the best possible results that way. Don't get me started on licensing changes by VC. No, no, no. I just, I, Even I won't do that. Um, I, do not, I do understand it. I'm back over here in the romantic idealism corner with my coffee, drinking my coffee, sadly. The end. <laughs> Uh, how do you ensure the longevity of the community? Uh, contributing is hard, but making it last over time is hard. Perhaps it should be harder or expensive. Okay, that is also an excellent question. I'm going to give you many answers. Okay, so if you talk to my friends over at Open Collective, or if you read... Uh, I can't believe I have forgotten her last name and I can't believe I have forgotten her name of the name of her paper from the Ford Foundation. There's a researcher named, researcher named Nadia and I am humiliated that I do not remember her last name. Excuse me, Nadia. Uh, she was briefly at GitHub. She wrote a paper for the Ford Foundation called Roads and Bridges, where she was looking at the impact of a lack of funding on our vital infrastructure because so much of our vital technology infrastructure is open source. And in the case of some software, there are one or two people working on it. They have a consulting firm that pays their bills. You hope that they have time to make sure that SSL works properly. Turns out that is not a winning strategy. Um, so to some extent, long-term sustainability of a project is about making sure there's funding to pay the people who are working on it so that they can focus on improving that software. Um, you can do this through uh, direct funding of projects through like a software foundation or direct funding to that project itself through other vehicles. You can do this by sponsoring open source projects through platforms like Open Collective. Uh, and you can do uh, funding of projects through um, other means like GitHub has um, like a tipping function I don't think we care about Git tip anymore. That was a long time ago. Like I said, I'm old. So again, projects need money. Now, if you talk to my buddies in inner source land, they will tell you that it's not so much that, that open source project communities need money, it's that they need maintainers. And you can easily conflate the concept of maintainers with money. And they will tell you that the best way to ensure the sustainability of free and open source software projects is actually to help developers within traditional firms who do not understand how to engage with open source software projects to train those developers to be able to do that work and contribute the work they are doing within their companies into open source because there are way more developers who understand how to do software development well in traditional organizations that don't participate in open source projects, then you can ever hope to train up or recruit developers who are only uh, who only know the open source context, right? And then lastly, uh, open source projects need humans. And they do not just need humans who write code. They also need humans who have other skills. And if you are a company who cares about a particular free and open source software project, it's Wonderful if you can provide them with cash. It is wonderful if you can provide them with software development resources. It is also wonderful if you can help provide them with resources that do that vital glue work that mean any, that mean any project is successful. Project managers, documentarians, marketers, people who put on events, like all of those things are required in order for a community to be sustainable. 
And it is not just from the perspective of there's a whole list of work that needs to get done. You also have to consider that if your primary uh, interest in that in that group is, is the code they write, if you do not give humans to support these other functions, your developers in that project are going to be doing these other functions. Turns out maybe you want them writing code. Maybe you would have, rather have them writing code than worry about things like, do we write the press release about our latest release of fabulous software? Turns out you want them writing the software, not the fabulous press release. I hope that that was a useful answer to this question. If not, you can get me on the Twitter, on the LinkedIn, or by email. Super. I remember to unmute. So there's one more. Uh, no, actually, there's a couple. To yep. Fill in that Nadia's uh, last name is Eggball. Eggball, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Too big, late. Big Too late now. In the comments. <laughs> So do you at Red Hat use some method to calculate the costs in your community engagement in relation to the pros and cons? So, so the answer to that question is yes. <clears throat> and I have to say that to some extent, it's more an art than a science. Uh, and one of the reasons it's more of an art than a science is we, we make, <clears throat> excuse me, we make our decisions about community investments from, from a wide variety of perspectives, right? So if you remember kind of like those first five options, I said like, you know, technology led advancing the state of the art or sales led where there's a, a business development aspect to it, um, et cetera. So those are part of the criteria that we use. You notice that there's no like specific KPI attached to any of those approaches, right? So we measure the return on investment in, in a couple of different ways, right? So for some types of investment, there are very traditional ROI metrics. So for example, we go to an event that was put on by the FinTech Open Source Foundation. We like engaging with these folks because they do cool work in the FinTech and financial services space. How many speakers do we get on the program? Were they talking about Red Hat Technologies? Did we do get to do, hello, small human. Did we get to do any lead generation activities as part of this? participation? Did somebody get into our drip campaign? Did they attend an FSI coffee break as a result of getting into our drip campaign? It's a draw, right? And then, you know, do they finally make it through the funnel to buy more Red Hat? We hope they make it through the funnel and buy more Red Hat. I like my job and I appreciate getting my salary. Um, for some community engagement activities, we don't have those sorts of rigorous metrics because it is more about deepening the customer relationship and deepening the perceived value of our company from a strategic thought leadership and helping you along on your journey perspective. And I have been doing community engagement now for almost 20 years. And I will tell you right now, good luck measuring that. I mean, the person who tells me how this could be done, I will, I will invest in your company. I will subscribe to your newsletter. I will hire you to work for me. Like the closest thing I have ever seen is this concept of the DevRel qualified lead, which folks should check out. Uh, a very talented community strategist named Mary Thangball did an excellent write-up on DevRel qualified leads and how you can look at sort of community engagement metrics and map them to traditional business metrics. But frankly, like you, it's impossible. If, as far as I can tell, and I love solving impossible problems, I really do, but as far as I can tell, it is impossible to be able to measure that people feel good about interacting with you and they trust you and they want to get your advice and they want to contribute to your livelihood. You feel that, right? You don't, you don't get a tableau chart about that. You just don't. One day we might get there but we're not there yet. So, so for some types of engagements that are really focusing on like deepening the customer relationship and establishing intimacy with the customer or partner or prospect, the success metrics are, do we know that we did well and that they want to keep talking to us and they respect what we have to say and do they trust us? There's another human in the yeah. room. <laughs> the probably the next speaker. Probably uh, the next speaker joining. So. I will clearly risk you on having a heart attack now, but I'll fire off one more. Do you have any interesting clash with a, a community like um, where you had a um, disagreement? Me personally or my company? Company and personally. 
I will say from a personal perspective, there have been communities with whom I have engaged where I have preferred to spend my work hours focused on other communities while making sure that I met the needs of my stakeholders in that community. Okay, pretty good answer. Not, there will be no naming of names. I do not tell anybody about the private conversations I have with anyone ever. That's why people trust me and I am not gonna poop on people even if they deserve to be pooped on. <laughs> But if you want to find out about people with whom I choose to spend less time while still wishing them success in their quest, we can do that one day over an iced tea or a beer. Um, but I will still not name names. But you may figure out who it is, and that is between you and your own imagination. Um, from, the, from the company perspective, um, I mean, I'm sure it's happened. It has not happened it has not happened so much in the, in the work that I'm doing right now. Um, I think you could probably, I think you can probably guess that some people were not super thrilled with uh, Red Hat's engagement with, uh, you know, continuing to sponsor production of CentOS Linux. I didn't work on that. I just want to give mad props to my colleague, Rich Bowen, for his engagement with that community and his stewardship of the community through that process. It was not easy for anyone involved. Um, I would also suggest that you have uh, an iced tea or a beer one day with uh, Brian Axelbeard and Rich Bowen to hear some more about um, some of the behind the scenes stuff that went there, which I am and not at liberty to disclose, but I will say the situation is a lot more complex than ends up on the front page of the register. Um, and I am admittedly, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I am a Red Hat fangirl. This company has treated me very well and with a lot of respect and has taken care of me when I needed to take medical leave, to take care of my daughter, et cetera, et cetera. I've given talks about that. Like my biases are clear. Um, but I will also say that um, that situation is a lot more complex than meets the eye. And I feel like I feel like things could have been handled differently. Maybe people made choices I would not have made, but I also think that folks who think that Red Hat has acted in some kind of evil or horrifically bad fashion in this situation may, may have other information that they wish they had before making that decision. Cool. We need to stop now, otherwise you won't kill me. Um, I don't want to kill you, I like you. <laughs> it was, it's been very, very, very nice. No, I can be, uh, I'll okay. be the good cop, I like that. Finally. <laughs> Thank you very much, Leslie. Lovely to have you here. Thank and you, we will Thank be you for having me. Cheers. <laughs>